I'm not particularly brave, but I'm also not particularly stupid. And I don't, and uh, you know, I got in trouble with one Yakuza boss who's really a vicious, horrible human being. He's still alive. He's kind of like the Richard Branson of the Yakuza. He, he used to be the biggest owner of Japan Airlines, except much more of a sociopath. Um, and when I realized that, you know, that uh, he put a contract out on me, um, that the stupid thing to do would be try to run away because everybody who's tried to run away from this guy gets killed. Moving from a farm in Missouri to Japan as a university student, Jake Edelstein quickly became enthralled with the country, its culture and its crime scene. Pursuing his dream to become a journalist, he defied the odds, passing the notoriously difficult entrance exam to the world's largest circulation newspaper, the Yomiuri Shimbun, uh, which has around 15 million readers a day. But as the first ever foreigner to be taken on as a member of staff, he had a lot to prove. He went above and beyond to get his scoops, even if that meant putting his life on the line to dig up dirt on the much-feared Yakuza, Japan's answer to the mafia. He decided to chronicle these early days of his career in his memoir, Tokyo Vice, which has now been immortalised on the screen with Hollywood actor Ansel Elgort re reliving some of Edelstein's most terrifying memories. Now in his 50s, he continues to captivate audiences with his investigations into Japanese society and its darker underbelly. Jake Edelstein joins me now. Jake, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the programme, and I am totally gripped um, by Tokyo Vice. But before we actually go on to talk about uh, that program and uh, your story in, in, in Japan. Can you just tell me, first of all, what took, I mean, I've said farm boy. I don't know if that's just a presumption <laughs> on, on my researchers part. Is every, is every boy from Missouri presumed to be a farm boy? Um, what? But what took you from Missouri to Japan? Because it is quite an incongruous leap, isn't it, as a teenager? Well, I mean, you know, it is true. I did grow up on a farm. I, I was just back there a couple a couple of days ago. Um, our our donkey buckwheat is getting very old now, and uh, he's never been the same since he was castrated, which was a terrible <laughs> terrible thing. Uh, <laughs> so, so you you went back to say your goodbyes, did you? Uh, yeah, you know, I went to see my parents, and uh, you know, my father's still eighty five. He's still the uh, assistant medical examiner, which means he's He's still doing autopsies, um, you know, though at 85, he's noticing that he's often um, much older than the people he's autopsying. But, you know, I think he's doing well with that sort of existential crisis. At 85, um, I'd only want him digging around in my body if I was dead, I have to say. Yeah. Um, well, he definitely knows what he's doing. Um, was it was it his job that initially got you interested in crime, if not in Japanese culture? Oh, Yes, I mean, the, the interest in crime was growing up, you know, hearing my father talk about, uh, you know, as family conversation about difficult cases and not difficult cases and murders and accidents and those things. So this was helpful on the police beat in Japan because I wasn't faced by, you know, by gruesome things. I mean, you know, I've sort of grown up used to listening to them. Um, I, I got interested in Japan through karate, which I think was, you know, in my era, you know, before anime was big, that was like one of the ways that you ended up being interested in Japan. Or maybe you read a terrible novel like The Ninja or something by Eric Van Lusbader. Um, Watch uh, Teenage Ninja Mutant Turtles. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I think actually by the time Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was out, I was probably in college. But um, uh Okay, but there's a big difference between becoming interested in in, in Japanese. I think you studied it a little bit at at college in in Missouri, and actually taking the giant leap um, yes, to go yes. and live there. Well, you know, I you know I lived most of my life in Missouri, right? But I also live near McBain, Missouri, where there's you know this railroad, one of the last railroads that goes through the areas. And I remember growing up, and you know. You know, you hear that at around midnight, you'd hear the, the sound of the train whistle. And I was thinking, you know, someday I would like to get on that train. That's so Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> it, is, it is, but I would like to go as far as I could on that train away from Missouri and see the world outside. So when there was an opportunity to study in Japan and uh, really technically I shouldn't have even been allowed to go as a second year student because um, you were required to have two years of Japanese. But when I applied, and I mean, I really applied on a whim, we had this 
uh, situation at the University of Missouri um, where we had you know, 20 Japanese students coming from Sophia University um, and none coming from the University of Missouri. And, and, you know, and in a surprise sit down meeting with the head of the International Studies Department, I said, well, you know, I, I don't know a lot, but I know that it's not an exchange if you have 20 people coming, we have no one going. So you should be glad that I want to go and you should let me go. And that was probably the first negotiation I ever successfully done in my life. And, uh, and, so, and so you got to, to Tokyo, I think, in the early 90s. Is that right? Actually, in 1988, I was oh, like, 19, yeah. 1988, yeah. But and, Japan was still in the bubble. Well, yeah, but I was just talking to my colleague, Matt Chorley, um, uh, earlier this morning about it on air. And, 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 you know, Japan seemed to be incredibly enticing to perhaps less Americans, but a lot of young people um, in, in Europe and particularly in, in the UK in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. And they all seemed to go there. And no matter how... Um, challenged their looks end up modeling and so on and apparently the nightlife was incredible and um, in, in a way that it doesn't seem to have the same draw these days describe to me what you arrived to find well so japan was in this middle of this economic bubble right like they were buying up the empire state building and you know and J japan was very full of itself and you know uh there were it was expensive but there were many jobs like teaching English, um, and, you know, which is the job you always start with first, right? Because you don't you don't know anything else. Um, that paid extremely well. Um, you know, you're you're making like fifty dollars an hour. Wow. Um, you know, teaching teaching people, and it's like this is really good. It was, you know, Tokyo was vibrant. The nightlife was incredible. I mean, it really was like the city never slept. Um, and uh, and also for me, because I was going to. Even though I was an exchange student, I was going to Sophia University, which is, I mean, kind of like a Harvard Yale kind of thing in Japan. So that afforded you an immediate sort of status. Like not only are you a foreigner from America, you know, at a time when Americans were revered, and there was actually a time like that. It's hard to remember now. I'm um, trying to cast my head back. <laughs> um, um, you know that the, 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 the people are very nice to you. Um, you know, on a superficial level. Um, but you, of course, you don't know that yet because you're a student and you know, you just understand what you see on the surface. So it was a great time to be in Japan. And, um, you know, as I was at the university and I was studying um, in, in Japan, the system is a little strange in that, you know, if you go to a good university, you, you try to get a job before you graduate. And then they, they, they call it night day. So they promise you a job. So it, I think before I'd even graduated, I had been promised a job at Sony Music Entertainment, what is now Sony Music Entertainment. Um, so I had, you know, I was like, I had nothing to worry about, but I had years of school to go. And I was writing for the school newspaper in Japanese, mostly to amuse myself and also to force myself to improve my Japanese because I'm like, if I don't have a goal, I won't, I won't, I won't push myself. I think most people are like that. But, but you and, learned yeah. Japanese extraordinarily quickly. I mean, I think in three years, you were so fluent that you managed to secure the job you're just going to describe for me with an entrance exam that is notoriously difficult at oh, um, yes. the, the I newspaper. Did study for, I, I did study for that exam. So, you know, my, my colleague, well, you know, I was also total immersion. I was living in this Zen Buddhist temple, you know, in... in of course you, know, you were. <laughs> Of course, of course, because doesn't everybody live in the Zen Buddhist temple? Um, uh, and, you know, and, and in the neighborhood, you know, nobody was going to speak English to me. So that was a good thing. Um, and all my colleagues at the school newspaper were, take, were preparing for these exams because, you know, it's like anything like an SAT or um, I'm not sure in, in England what is the standardized test that people take for um, getting into college. But uh, I was preparing and I was studying and um, you know, and, and my grasp of written and reading and writing Japanese was very good. I, my listening ability was was not so good. And my speaking ability was not so good. Um, but, you know, the Japanese language, the written language is just a nightmare. When the Jesuits called, the, you know, Japanese the devil's language, they were talking about the written language because uh, it is just crazy. I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, the Japanese themselves have a huge trouble writing and reading their own language um, just because of the, how it was developed over the years. 
but you mastered uh, it um and yeah, and you yeah. and you got and you got a job at this newspaper the first foreigner as i understand it who ever uh worked for yomuri shimbam i'm sure you can pronounce it much better but nevertheless um and it was a very exacting process to get in and quite a hostile environment dare i say when you got there it, it, it was a hostile environment to everybody because J Japan is a vertical society. And I don't think people understand that, that even in the language that is, it's completely embedded in there. You cannot speak Japanese properly without recognizing your relationship to the person um, you're speaking with and, and whether that's above you or below you or equal to you. And in the, you know, I came in with a group of like six people and, you know, they didn't even bother to learn our names for the first couple of months. So we just call us Ichinensei, which means like first year. It'd be like Ichinensei, and they would motion with like a hand, like, like, like he'll be calling a dog. And you know, after a while, after about six months, they started to remember our names. Um, you know, it, it, it was brutal for everyone. But but I also felt it was kind of egalitarian in the sense, like, you know, I did get special treatment. I got treated like everybody else. Uh, yeah, not yeah, just yeah. not just hierarchical or vertical as you describe it, but also, uh, and I hope uh, you agree with this. But I mean, watching Tokyo Vice and also, you know, having read quite a bit about the culture um, in the intervening years and, and 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 so on, a very deeply misogynistic culture as well. Oh yes, yes, incredibly misogynistic. I think even now Japan's gender equality ranking is like 140 out of 160 countries. I mean, so maybe, maybe a little bit better than Korea, and that hasn't changed. I mean, misogynistic, not racist so much, but xenophobic, like a, a fear of the outsiders. So, you know, but I would have to say that growing up is, the, is like the only Jew in my school in, in you know, in the Midwest with, with a bunch of rednecks was like, you know, I didn't feel that out of place. I'm just like, <laughs> oh, I, I've, just, I've just changed the environment just a little. People are speaking a different language, but it's not it's not so much different than writing bus 57. So we've talked about the the, the sort of downside, if you will, uh, about the culture and the lack of warm embrace, perhaps both at your in your workplace and also sort of culturally, perhaps uh, more in general. But what was it you loved enough to make you want to make it big in Japan, as the song goes? Um, and and uh, then let's talk about what then became your immersion into the Yakuza because that's so fascinating in itself. Well, what I liked about it after I realized that while that, you know, unlike most Japanese corporations that the newspapers are meritocracy. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it didn't matter what school you graduated from or uh, how long you'd been in the company. If you were, you know, if you were writing good news stories and you were getting scoops, then you were treated with the deference of successful in that sense of meritocracy is you know it's rare in Japanese society um and I was you know the harder you work the more of a reward it is and it was kind of almost sort of like unwritten rules like oh you had a scoop like last week you know that was on the national edition so we're not going to even ask you what you're up to this week we're just going to assume that you're working on something important so you know the, so that that uh, ability to have a little more freedom and a little more leeway and to pick some of your own stories once you could show that you could you you could you could do the job right was was quite refreshing so um, was and, it was it ambition um or was it your own particular fascination that took you into the underworld as it were of the yakuza you know i i would love to be able to say that i was really fascinated by japan's underworld but I wasn't, it wasn't a huge source of interest to me. Um, either the evolution of it was that in my first year on the job, there was a huge news story about a husband and wife, they were dog breeders, and they were also serial killers. Um, and one of the people that they killed was a Yakuza boss and his driver who were blackmailing them. And as we sensed that this was going to be the big story of the year, which it was in 1993, um, you know, the people on the police beat, we all got sort of assigned to follow what happened to this one missing person on the last day. And so as I was following the Yakuza guy, I was like, okay, I need, I, I need to know more about the Yakuza. And then I made friends with one of the detectives who was from the organized crime section. Um, uh, who became a bit I, of a mentor, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just like you could stop. And, so and, and then by my second year, you know, 
my boss took me aside. He said, okay, you know, Adelstein, you've done some really good work. We're not putting you in a local bureau. We're going to keep you on the police beat and you're going to cover the Yakuza. You're going to cover the cops that police the Yakuza. He said, and here's why. He said, 30% of the Yakuza are gaiji, like non-Japanese. They're Koreans, people who were slave labor during the war, um, are people who are outcast in Japanese society. He said, you're an outcast and you're a gaiji, so you'll fit in fine. <laughs> um, but it is... But it is the equivalent of sort of being sent on assignment to Naples, let's say. In fact, worse than that, choosing to go on assignment uh, in Naples and then investigating the Camorra. You know, I mean, it, it, it's not the best idea in the world. Tell us a little bit about the Yakuza, because uh, what's fascinating uh, uh, about them is that they're a, they're a grouping. I mean, for a start, they're huge. I think, you know, the mafia at its at its height, you know, was sort of 5,000 members in the US and and, and the Yakuza is something like 80,000 yeah, members of, of Yakuza started, affiliated group. When I started, there was about 84,000 active Yakuza. Um, the thing is that in Japan, um, they exist in the open, you know, especially when I started in the 1990s. Uh, they had office buildings, they had business cards, people knew where they were. There were fan magazines or monthly fan magazines. I've got at home now a stack, I picked them up on some internet auction, 20 years of Yakuza fan magazines, because you know, because I'm interested in the history, right? So- But why were they like, allowed to get away with that? Why were they allowed to be so prominent? I mean, oh, I think that the recession in the nineties was actually called the Yakuza recession because they were so deeply uh, integrated with the economy in, in Japan. Because- there, 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 there are a number of reasons that they were allowed to exist the way they are. One is that the constitution put in place um, in post-war Japan uh, ensured the, the, the right to assemble the right of groups. And the Yakuza would never claim that they were groups of criminals. They claimed we are humanitarian organizations upholding traditional Japanese values. Um, and they also followed a kind of social contract um, and, you know, and this is a little different from the mafia. If you go to a Yakuza office, and I don't think many people spend time in the Yakuza office, many of them, there's a list of things on the wall that will get you expelled from the group. And what gets you expelled used to be theft, um, robbery, sexual assault, um, dealing drugs. So in that sense, because you take these criminals and you keep them from doing street crime, you don't get mugged, they're not snatching your purse, they're not breaking into your house. There was this kind of sense amongst the Japanese police and the Japanese public is that we'd rather have organized crime and safe streets than disorganized crime. Um, so people were willing to look the other way for a long time. And you decided um, that you wouldn't. Um, and uh, so began your career delving into um, the sorts of things that they were involved in. Um, which put your life at great danger. Um, and, and you are known for doing some crazy things in order to uh, uh, get achieve your scoops. Uh, maybe you could enlighten us on a couple of, of the hairier uh, situations you found yourself in. I mean, many are documented in the TV series, but for those who perhaps haven't yet embarked on watching Tokyo Vice. Well, um, one of my less than bright decisions early on in my career, um, you know, uh, I, I think my, my local newspaper once wrote this article reviewing the book, which was like, um, I was, yeah, uh, Jake Adelstein, while growing up in Columbia, Missouri, which has the oldest journalism school in the United States, never attended the journalism school here because if he had, he wouldn't have broken all the ethics that journalists are taught to follow. He, he slept with sources, he blackmailed people, he intimidated police officers to get scoops. And I was like, I suppose this is a bad thing. Um, guilty but, as charged, Jake. I'm just asking. Guilty as charged. Um, you know the We would, you know, in Japan, we were taught more sort of situational ethics, which was like write the truth and protect your sources. If you can't protect your sources and write the truth, then you either need to find new sources or give up on the article. It was pretty simple. It's a pretty straightforward thing there. Um, but one of the hairier, hairier things I did earlier on is so, so I'm looking for this missing Yakuza who's been killed by a, uh, a serial killer um, because he was blackmailing a serial killer. And over time, as I'm trying to find out where he disappeared, 
you know, I discover that he has a young mistress working at a hostess club. I think I, I think I blurred this a little bit in the book because at the time, I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't want to get her in any trouble and she was still sort of working as a hostess, but, um, you know, uh, it's clear that her, her boyfriend is dead and I ended up, you know, from going from being sourced to like dating her. And, you know, and one time at her, at, I'm at her apartment, I hear this pounding on the door. Um, and this, you know, scary guy, you know, I open the door and he's like, you know, what are you doing here with, you know, Endo's mistress, you know, I should kill you. And I said like, you shouldn't kill me. You should thank me because you know that your boss is dead and I'm taking care of his mistress because there's nobody else to. <laughs> and, and, and it was so audacious that he just laughed and later we became friends and uh he I'm also right. became my bodyguard for a short time like in 2008 yes and you have i mean so so you know in the thick of it uh, over the course of two years you you delved pretty deep into yakuza culture and into yakuza crime and what was going on to the extent that by the end of it um, your life was threatened and perhaps worse, uh, they said that they'd go to your family first and um, yeah. so that you could you could live to see that happen. How did that change um, your determination uh, or did it? Uh, well, you, you know, what, I, I'm not particularly brave, but I'm also not particularly stupid and I don't, and I, you know, I got in trouble with one Yakuza boss who's really a vicious, horrible human being. He's still alive. He's kind of like the Richard Branson of the Yakuza. He, he used to be the biggest owner of Japan Airlines, except much more of a sociopath. Um, and when I realized that, you know, that uh, he put a contract out on me, um, that the stupid thing to do would be try to run away. Because everybody who's tried to run away from this guy gets killed. Because, because that's what he expects you to do. He just waits. Uh, the film director that, that um, angered him, Tommy Juzo, uh, was attacked at his home and his face was sliced up. A couple years later, he was thrown off the building when he tried to make another film about this gangster. Um, so I realized, you know, here's the situation. Um, I, I want to write an article that's going to ruin his career, get him kicked out of the Yakuza. So the best thing to do is actually get that article written. Um, but I needed time. Um, to get it in print. I need, cause I, I tried to get it print in Japan and no one would do it because um, they were so scared of him. Um, so I talked to the Washington Post and the Washington Post after vetting it was like, yeah, we'll do this story. Um, but during that time I needed to stay alive. So I hired an ex Yakuza to be my bodyguard. Um, he was actually the guy who once knocked on the door because I was bonking Endo's mistress. So, you know, it was a, a, an interesting development. How Interesting dynamic, yes. <laughs> dynamic. And then the other thing is, there's this wonderful saying in the Yakuza, which is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And, you know, Goto Tadamasa as a gangster had a lot of enemies within his organization. So I went to the person who stood to benefit the most by him losing power and said, you know, I, I'm, I'd like to write this article. I was wondering if you could comment. And, and you know, in that moment, because he's smart and I'm smart, this is how Japanese society works. You know, he realizes what I'm saying is, keep me alive long enough for me to write this article and I will disembowel your enemy and you can take over his turf and territory. And all I'm asking is that you keep me alive. But surely, um, um, but surely writing the article was a bit of a, a death warrant. Uh, I mean, to what do you credit your longevity? Because I think that you now, I mean, it must be what, three decades since you first started investigating the Yakuza. You still live in Japan. As I understand it, you have to live undercover to a great extent. Is, is that the case? And is it worth uh, it? These days I'm, I am living, I'm not under police protection, I'm living a very normal life. Um, what enabled me to get through this situation is that, uh, you know, his rival in the organization took a liking to me. Um, and the other thing is that even in the Yakuza world, there's a respect for fairness. Um, after the great uh, earthquake and the nuclear disaster in 2011, um, I was the first to write uh, that the Yakuza were actually sending people to the disaster area, even the irradiated area, is to take care of the people that had been, um, you know, had lost their homes or they were ill or they were suffering from the earthquake. Um, really? Why? Because it's part of the Yakuza principle? 
By the way, if you say that you're a humanitarian organization, that you help the weak and fight the strong, then every now and then you have to live up to that. Um, and also because these organizations don't have any red tape um, and they have people who've experienced these things before, they're very good at handling a natural disaster. I mean, it's like they know exactly what to bring. It's like, okay, we need diapers, we need hot water, we need showers, we need porta potties, we need ramen, we need. Uh, yeah, and also uh, they have the, the the wherewithal and the fear factor in order to make sure they get given them. No, they if they say we need diapers, they get diapers. Oh yeah, it is, it's, it's, and, and, and they and they have and they own logistics companies because the Yakuza have always had uh, an illegal and a legal component. I think it was Ishii Susumu was one of the you know. When I say the greatest Yakuza, it sounds like I'm praising him, but I guess let me praise him. He's a, he's a, a brilliant businessman and the Yakuza leader. He said, you know, all Yakuza needs to have two jobs. They need to have their, their Ill illegitimate enterprise and the legitimate enterprise. So when there was a crisis, they, you know, they know who to go to. They know what shipping company to go to and they get everything there uh, that people need. One of the things that, that really struck me watching the series is, is to a great extent, how little Japanese culture and society has changed in the intervening decades. Is that fair, do you think? Yes, I mean, not only has it changed because, because of the economic, because of the bubble collapse, like for years, prices stayed the same. So, you know, when I talked about making 50, you know, $50 an hour um, teaching English in, you know, in the 1980s, that was great then. It's, you know, it's not so great now because, it, it, you know, Japan has been in kind of this sort of state of suspended animation for years. I mean, things change here too slowly sometimes. The fact, the fact that I still have to fax questions to the Japanese government um, is mind boggling. That's astonishing. Um, so you've managed now to transfer all your experiences, uh, first of all, into, into your memoir, Tokyo Vice, and now um, uh, those experiences have been uh, immortalized on the screen. And um, what was that like for you? Um, um, was, it, um, uh, was, it, was it interesting to, to, to relive them or did it feel very much like little time had passed? Because you do seem to be leading a similar life. Uh, well, uh... It was exciting in parts, and it was also um, like stress-inducing um, because there, you know, there are things that um, you don't want to recall. But you know, colleagues that have passed away, and um, uh, the stress of the job, even taking the test. I mean, I was watching the the episode, you know, like the episode where, where the one of the, the first episode with my with my girlfriend now Jesse and. Uh, she was like, you're sweating. And I'm like, yes, I'm sweating because it's exactly what it was like taking that test. Like all the stress of taking that test of, of turning over the sheet and being like, oh my God, I've forgotten to do like all the questions on the back of here. Like it all came back. Um, uh, I, I have had you know, some years where I, I left reporting for a while. Um, I worked for the State Department on a study of human trafficking. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, spend some more time writing longer works. Uh, most of it has been published in France, which is bizarre. Um, you know, when you talk about big in Japan, like I, I, you know, the places that I'm big are big in France and big in New Zealand, where our podcast about missing people was the number one podcast for a week. I, hey, New Zealand, I love you. <laughs> I had no idea that, that that you were such a fan of my work. Um, it, it's, it, it, you know, my, my kids came for the premiere. And it was interesting to watch their reaction to it. Um, and it interested enough my daughter that she spent the summer interning with me, um, working did on you, this podcast and, and, and studying journalism. I don't know the answer to this question, but did you marry a, a Japanese woman? I did, I did, I did. Um, we, we separated amicably a long time ago, but you know, we have a very cozy relationship and the kids, you know, two kids, um, who are half well, Japanese, obviously. Half Japanese, half Japanese, yeah. Actually, there was this really, this is kind of a diversionary story, but once in a moment of extremely bad parenting, um, and this tells you a little bit about how things work in Japan. I was at the airport. My daughter was six or seven. And my son was like five. Um, they were sitting on the floor. And, and, you know, Benny, my daughter, started speaking to this Japanese woman. And she was like, hey, 
you know, everyone in our family, and she's saying all this in Japanese, everyone in our family is Japanese. I'm Japanese, my mother's Japanese. She points at me, except he's not Japanese. And then she looks at her brother with like this mischievous grin and she goes, oh, and he's Chinese. And she says in Japanese, Chinese. And, and Ray is like sitting there with his Legos. He leaps up from the, from the ground, like, like, on, like, you know, like on all fours playing with Legos. And he jumps on his sister, starts pounding her head. And I said, and, and instead of saying like, you know, like let's not do this racism thing. I was just like, Betty, he is not Chinese. He is Japanese. He, he might look Chinese, but he's Japanese. <laughs> there you go. Clearly the response of someone who's lived there for a very long time. Um, so you've mentioned your podcast about people who mysteriously go uh, missing in Japan. Well, what's next for you, uh, Jake Edelstein? Um, does television beckon more uh, now that you've had the taste of it? Uh, we're doing a season two of, of, of Tokyo Vice. I'm working on that now. Um, the chief writer is a, my high school friend. It's a small role. Um, I have a sequel to Tokyo Vice coming out. I think it's coming out in the UK this autumn called Tokyo Private Eye, which picks up where the book ends and should answer some questions for someone. Um, and then I have another book coming out that was actually came out years ago in France called The Last Yakuza, which is my history of the Yakuza. So I have two books coming out in English this year. I'm very excited. My, well, my plan is to just do nothing this year, as little as possible. I'm going to read some books. Well, um, I, might do I have to say, it already <laughs> sounds like you're failing in your plan, but uh, that's a <laughs> delight. Um, thank you very much uh, for talking to me. Uh, that was the journalist and inspiration behind hit TV show Tokyo Vice, Jake Edelstein. Thanks thank again. It's been great to talk to you.